We can go now. Thank you everyone for joining us at the Collegiate Peaks Forum series. This is our uh, second to the last lecture for the season. Our, our finale lecture will be Temple Grandin on November 5th. Uh, the, the Collegiate Peaks Forum is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to provide free lectures in spirituality, philosophy, and science. We are supported by those people that, uh, that uh, donate, and we'd like to thank all of those and our sponsors. And with that, I'd like to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Christine Whittington. Thank you, Kelly. I'm very pleased to introduce perhaps the world's only Renaissance entomologist, Dr. Jeffrey Lockwood. Jeff earned a PhD in entomology from Louisiana State University and was an insect ecologist for 15 years at the University of Wyoming. In 2003, he metamorphosed, and uh, it's a great term for an entomologist, but it isn't mine. I stole it from his faculty profile, uh, into a professor of natural sciences and humanities in the Department of Philosophy, where he teaches environmental ethics and philosophy of ecology, and in the program of creative writing, where he serves as director and teaches workshops in nonfiction. As a Renaissance entomologist, Jeff can discuss Kafka's memorable character, Gregor Samsa, the employment of insects as weapons of war, and the morality of the extermination business, in which people who love insects enough to study them morph into mass murderers of sometimes harmless creatures. He's also the author of a series of murder mysteries featuring Riley the Exterminator. Extermination is also the subject of Jeff's lecture tonight, and also his opera, which I can't wait to see and hear. Rocky Mountain locust swarms are the stuff of nightmares. Some of us may remember reading Laura Ingle Wilder's Little House Books, I know at least one of us does, on the banks of the Plum Creek, describes in detail, really too horrific for a children's book, the locust swarms of the 1870s and 80s. An August 28, 2020 article in, Den in the Denver Post stated, Colorado may be dealing with record heat, wildfire haze, and the pandemic in 2020. At least we don't have locusts. In 1875, a swarm of locusts so thick it blackened the sky swarmed over Colorado. And then, a few decades later, they were gone. The last Rocky Mountain locust was recorded in 1902. Maybe that's, <clears throat> I think that's true. Jeff can correct me if not. Thank goodness, we might say. However, Jeff Lockwood asks the question, how should we think about the loss of this humbling life form? I learned about Jeff, Jeff Lockwood when I read a review of his 2013 book, The Infested Mind, Why Humans Fear, Loathe, and Love Insects. I immediately put it on my Christmas list because we share an affliction, a phobia about grasshoppers and locusts. Now that is not a good affliction to have if your career uh, is studying locust swarms. But Jeff tackled the subject head on, exploring why humans are simultaneously fascinated and repelled by insects, proving himself to be a huge interdisciplinary thinker. This exploration led to his metamorphosis into a philosophy and writing professor, as well as an entomologist. Okay, before we start, please remember to post questions for Dr. Lockwood in the chat so that we can discuss them at the end of the lecture. So without further ado, Dr. Jeffrey Lockwood on the Rocky Mountain Locust, an environmental murder mystery. Thank you, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be virtually with you this evening. Um, I just wanna say a couple of words about the way this presentation will unfold. 
what I'm going to do is give a set of lectures, little lectures, 15, 20 minutes. And between them, they will be used to set up the three scenes of Locust the Opera. So it'll go lecture, opera, lecture, opera, lecture, opera. Um, and each segment takes about 15 or 20 minutes. I think the whole thing will be over in uh, no more than two hours, at least. Uh, that's, that's the plan. Uh, it's, it's a chamber opera, so it's only 50 or 55 minutes in length. And then with my lecture, um, we should come in at about two hours. So and that'll give you time to, um, to watch the, the unfolding uh, disaster on, on, on the, the presidential stage. So you can catch the end of the debate, perhaps. Okay, so let me begin with uh, by uh, sharing my screen to do a oh, PowerPoint. Here we are. Okay. All right, so we begin. Opera is a remarkable art form. Having existed and adapted to a changing environment for more than 400 years. This synergistic combination of soliloquy, dialogue, costume, scenery, action, and music flourishes because of two essential features. First, opera is grounded in synergy, the power of words and the supreme capacity of music to distill, crystallize, and intensify the meaning of words. Words evoke self-reflection and rational analysis while music elicits emotional reflection and transcendent feeling. And second, opera is rooted in the archetypes. Archetypes exemplify timeless human struggles. Carl Jung believed that universal mythic characters reside within the collective unconscious of people the world over. Archetypes represent fundamental human motifs of our experience as we evolved, consequently, they evoke deep emotions. Well, how does this very brief account explain my motivation to transform science into song, to write an opera about an insect? The relationship between humanity and the natural world is perhaps the longest standing tension in the history of our species. Locusts tap into an ancient dread among agricultural civilizations. These insects represent uncontrollable power and unimaginable vulnerability, evoking a sense of our own capacity to shape the world and our existential insecurity on a planet that is changing around us. The Rocky Mountain Locust provides an epic tale of devastating ascendance and mysterious disappearance of the rise and fall of a biological empire. Here is their story intertwined with our own history of courage and fear. The tiny limp body had been violently mangled. Although the corpse had also begun to rot, it still retained distinguishing features and the essence of its original form. Having spent years searching for precisely these remains, I was able to identify the body as being that of Melanopus spretus, the Rocky Mountain locust, the only locust known to have existed in North America. This was the first incontrovertible specimen of this creature to be collected in nearly a hundred years. Its extinction, which culminated in the early days of the 20th century, represented the loss of a continental scale process. No longer would this living conveyor belt distribute immense loads of organic material across the Great Plains. Consider that large swarms weighed thousands of tons and required a hundred thousand pounds of vegetation a day to stoke their metabolic fires. No longer would an eerie shadow sweep across the cloudless prairie and then give way to the papery rattle of billions, even trillions of insects in flight. These events are still known on every inhabited landmass, but North America will never again experience the staggering scale of life and motion the humbling sweep of fecundity or a biological eclipse of the sun. After finding the first small body in the ice of northwestern Wyoming's Knife Point Glacier, my colleagues and I began an excited search for more, eventually recovering 130 largely intact remains. Each was cataloged, dried for preservation, and individually stored for future study. 
The icy grave had served an effective, if somewhat brutal, final resting place. Based on radiocarbon dating and geological analyses, we surmise that as the first opera was being performed in Italy, and as the pilgrims were arriving at Plymouth, this swarm of Rocky Mountain locusts originating from the river valleys that would one day become part of Yellowstone National Park was being swept up the valley and blown onto the glacier. Scattered across the ice in a seething carpet of brown green bodies, some of the locusts may have managed to escape and continue their journey, but millions were immobilized by the cold. In the course of summer melting, they were washed into the crevasses that split the top of the ice field. With time, they were frozen deep in the glacier and slowly transported down the side of the mountain until they came to a point 750 feet below the crevassed section. Here, the slope flattens abruptly and the ice in a slow motion version of the rapids that form at the base of a waterfall becomes turbulent, churning the embedded contents to the surface. For the first time in 400 years, the locusts emerge into the light. Although the swarm associated with these frozen bodies has long faded from memory, the Rocky Mountain locust is deeply embedded in the lore and culture of the American West. So let's begin the story of the Rocky Mountain locust in the period of the old frontier, an era in which new lands were being explored. From here, we can see how this creature came to shape the nation during a time of pioneers, farmers, miners, naturalists, a time in which a young country was trying to grasp the promises and perils of its frontier. This is the story of what happened, a powerful context for understanding what extinction means for humanity. With a voyeuristic eye, we can peek into the lives of the pioneers, reading from the letters they sent back to family in the East. In July of 1874, Edwin Snyder of Highland, Kansas, penned a chilling description of a summertime blizzard transforming into a swarm of locusts. He wrote, at our place, they commenced coming down about one o'clock in the afternoon. They came rattling and pattering on the houses and against the windows, falling in the fields, on the prairies, and in the waters, everywhere and on everything. By about four o'clock in the afternoon, every tree and bush, buildings, fences, fields, roads, and everything except animated beings was completely covered with grasshoppers. Now we might be tempted to dismiss such pioneer tales as the stuff of legend and lore, but the federal government was reluctantly affirming the depth and breadth of the crisis. In the most desperate precincts, four out of every five families were at risk of starvation in the coming winter. A report from the frontier concluded with a plea for immediate action on the part of the government to avert the impending disaster. Great suffering exists in all five of these extreme frontier counties, the report said, to a fearful extent. The settlers are, in most instances, scattered over a large extent of the of country, a large portion of them living far up the numerous streams flowing into the Republican. If the winter should be as severe as that of 70 and 71 and as deep snows fall, beyond a doubt hundreds will starve unless a supply of provisions sufficient to last them through the winter is thrown into the valley and they are provisioned for an emergency of this character, for it would be out of the question for any aid society or the government even to reach anything like a majority of them in deep snows. As temperatures dropped and suffering mounted in early 1875, Congress took up the matter of the pioneer's plight in the bitterly cold days of winter. The Dakota, Missouri, and Platte departments of the Army participated in a massive relief effort. 1,957,000 food rations were distributed that winter to 107,535 people, including nearly 44,000 children. How many graves were filled with emaciated victims of the locusts that winter is not known, but perhaps hundreds succumbed to hunger. The number would likely have been in the thousands if the country had not rallied to save the starving settlers. The suffering of the pioneers is most powerfully etched into the American mind by the writings of Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House on the Prairie. In the fourth book of this classic series, locusts devastate the family farm on the banks of Plum Creek, and the father is forced to leave his family behind in search for work. His journey echoes our culture's canonical story of a people wandering in the wilderness, seeking the promised land. Laura learns from her mother's reading of scripture that locusts played a pivotal role in the time of the Egyptian pharaohs. 
And so the tale of the pioneers became interwoven with Western culture's most deep and abiding literary account of locusts. Perhaps the Wilders sensed that they were part of a great human migration, an American exodus across the continent. But what they did not know while watching their farm disappear under a blanket of locusts that summer was that no people on earth, and not even a pharaoh, had ever witnessed a swarm of such immensity. Albert Child. Albert Child was a Renaissance man of the frontier. After practicing medicine and serving as a school superintendent in Ohio, he moved to Nebraska to try his hand at farming. But Albert Child's real passion was not medicine, education, or agriculture. Rather, he adored the science of meteorology. In 1861, he began providing reports to the Smithsonian Institution, and his work was transferred to the U.S. Signal Corps when they took over as the country's weather service in 1873. This is how Albert Child came to be the right man in the right place at the right time to provide a definitive report of the most immense swarm of locusts in recorded history. He began his account with the objective tone of a trained and experienced observer, writing, the extent of the swarm is difficult to ascertain as the observer can only see a small belt. They may extend indefinitely right or left. During the flight from June 15 to 25 of 1875, I telegraphed east and west. I found a continuous line moving northward of 110 miles and then somewhat broken 40 miles farther. The movement of the winds for the five days averaged about 10 miles per hour and the locust evidently moved considerably faster than the wind, at least 15 miles per hour. Today we can surmise that the swarm was carried by the Great Plains low-level jet, a 200 mile wide conveyor belt of air extending from the Gulf Coast to the Canadian border and centered over Oklahoma and Kansas. These summertime winds peak at about a thousand feet above the surface and average 10 miles per hour during the day rising to 30 miles per hour at night, which matches Dr. Child's account perfectly. Like any good scientist, Dr. Child took his data and transformed the raw numbers into a complete picture of what he had witnessed. The mathematics were simple, but the results were nearly beyond imagination. When Dr. Child presented his straightforward calculations as to the aggregate size of the locust swarm that was passing over Nebraska, he was incredulous of his own findings, writing, they were visible from six to seven hours of each of the successive five days, and I can see no reason to suppose that their flight was checked during the whole of the five days. If so, the army in the line of advance would be 120 hours by 15 miles per hour, 1,800 miles in length, and say even 110 miles in width, an area of 198,000 square miles, and then from one quarter to one half mile deep. This is utterly incredible, yet how can we put it aside? The swarm was probably an elongated stream of insects, but if it had been configured in a more familiar geometric shape, it would have comprised a square 450 miles on a side. Imagine the entire state of Colorado blanketed beneath, beneath three and a half trillion locusts, outnumbering the current human population on earth by a factor of 600 to one. Such quantities are unfathomable. The newspaper stories of damage from across the West clearly substantiate Dr. Child's observations. If we find it difficult to imagine such a mass of life, it is even more challenging to grasp that less than 30 years after Dr. Child's account, the Rocky Mountain locust disappeared forever. And now I would like to share with you the opening 13 minute scene from Locust the Opera in which the audience is introduced to the story of the Rocky Mountain Locust. I must take a moment to tell you that the musical score was composed by my enormously talented colleague, Dr. Ann Gutso of UW's music department. And I would hasten to further note that the sets and costumes were designed by my gifted artist colleague, Ashley Carlisle of the UW Department of Visual and Literary Arts. You'll also notice in this opening scene that the audience rattles tissue paper at the direction of the conductor. Simulate the sound of an arriving swarm as the locust enters the theater. Enjoy, and we'll return to delve into the mystery of the creature's sudden disappearance. So let me take just a moment here to 
stop sharing that. Very good. Um, whoops, oops, 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 oops. Okay. Um, now let me go back to screen share. This will be the opening scene with computer sound. Here we are.
waiting fields Leaving nothing I've read such tales of misery I've heard such tales of misery Seem as a biblical plague. But I am a pious man. Why have they returned? Okay. Whoops, let's go. Ah, there we are. Okay, so let me cut back to my lecture here. Whoops. I'm sorry. I'm do funny things. Screen share. Here we are. Now then. So at first, the disappearance of the locust was simply unbelievable, but an enticing explanation soon emerged. You see, a locust is a special kind of grasshopper, not a particular taxonomic group. The locust has a peculiar life history strategy as we heard, a sort of Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde transmogrification that involves the capacity to change its anatomy, physiology, and behavior in response to environmental cues, especially crowding. The gregarious or migratory phase is darker in color, has longer wings, and exhibits a propensity for aggregation, which accounts for its forming into dense bands of nymphs that develop into vast swarms of adults. In the solitary phase, the locust is indistinguishable from a grasshopper. The initial theory of the Rocky Mountain locust disappearance was that the extinction was an illusion. The solitary phase was believed to still exist, but a change in ecological conditions, it was thought, simply prevented the appearance of the well-known gregarious form. Entomologists proposed various candidates for the solitary form, but despite heroic efforts to force a transformation, nobody could reincarnate the Rocky Mountain locust. 
in more recent times, analysis of DNA extracted from locust specimens preserved in glacial ice have confirmed that the Rocky Mountain locust was a true species, not simply the migratory form of some still existing grasshopper. So what could possibly account for the extinction of a species that once infested two thirds of the United States? For half a century, scientists proposed and refuted a series of explanations. An acclaimed entomologist argued that the changing climate at the end of the so-called Little Ice Age in the 1800s doomed the locust. However, others undermined this theory by pointing out that the thermal trend was too gradual to account for the extinction and, well, if anything, the warmer and drier conditions that began to prevail should have favored the locust. Another clever ecologist argued that the locust depended on bison to break up the sod and overgraze the grasslands to create favorable habitat. So the loss of bison meant that the insects were destined to decline. Uh -huh. But critics pointed out the Rocky Mountain locust preferred to lay its eggs in compact soils and moreover, bison would have competed with the insects for vegetation. Yet another scientist made the case that locusts depended on landscape alterations provided by the Native Americans who used fire to expand and maintain vast swaths of prairie. While forests did begin to encroach on grasslands following the extirpation of indigenous people, the scope and rate of change were far less than what was necessary to account for the disappearance of the insect. There seemed to be no ecological change of a sufficiently large scale to account for the locust demise. Ah, but therein lay the key. During outbreaks, the Rocky Mountain locust occupied nearly 2 million square miles, but the solution to its extinction was not the species ecology at the height of its flourishing. Instead, the answer lay in understanding the creature during the time of its most restricted distribution. As with other locusts, in most years, the climatic factors necessary to elicit an outbreak did not develop, and the populations eked out a living in highly restricted habitats where they could find adequate food for their bellies and suitable soil for their eggs. The fertile montane river valleys of the West were the locust sanctuary and its Achilles heel. During recession periods, it was constricted to an area of 950 square miles. The entire species would have comfortably fit into a circle of land 18 miles in diameter. Of course, the river valleys were not laid out in neat circles, nor were the locusts uniformly distributed. However, no matter how we parse out the locusts and their habitats, the implication is the same. This species was regularly squeezed into a tight ecological bottleneck. When the outbreak of the 1870s collapsed, the locust became concentrated in these mountain valleys. And its timing, oh, its timing could not have been worse, for these were precisely the lands that the pioneers sought to convert to agricultural production. See, farming the river valleys of the Rockies became enormously profitable thanks to the burgeoning demand for food by the mining industries. Growing grain, not finding gold, held the key to sure wealth. And so it was that the locust sanctuaries were decimated. The soils where the insect concentrated its eggs were plowed and harrowed. To add insult to injury, large tracts of land were planted to alfalfa, one of the very few plants the locusts could not abide. And to sustain this thirsty crop, farmers flooded the fields, drowning untold number of locust eggs. While upstream, beavers were eliminated along with their troublesome dams so that spring floods washed away both eggs and hatchlings. To make matters still worse, cattle and sheep were introduced to riparian areas where their grazing widened the waterways, further exposing the insects to inundation, not to mention the destruction of egg beds through the trampling of livestock. It sounds incredible, but the most spectacular success in the history of economic entomology, the only complete elimination of an agricultural pest species was the consequence of an unwitting bunch of frontier farmers armed with cows and plows. Indeed, there is much to learn in modern times from the lessons of the Rocky Mountain locust. Now then, to capture the struggle of science in discerning the cause of the locust's extinction, 
We turn to the second scene of the opera in which the locust haunts and taunts the scientist as he works his way through hypotheses. You'll also notice in this 22 minute scene, the audience creates the sound of a rainstorm at the direction of the conductor. Enjoy, and then we'll return to delve into the deeper meanings of the creature's extinction.
at me.
makes a crack like a rumble on a stampede or a bison
Just leave me alone. This room was a place where I could always return, where I could find safety and comfort. Until you came and Now, let me return 
Here we are. Return to the lecture. Oops, wait a minute. Are we still sharing screen? Yeah, here we are. Yes. Okay. So we leave the opera there. We return here. We'll return to it momentarily. So today we find ourselves in a new frontier, an era of shifting conceptual landscapes and moral perils, a time of CEOs, scientists, and conservationists, a time of grasping the consequences of our past, a time in which we wonder if our socioeconomic values are on a collision course with the constraints of the natural world and what this will mean for us and other living beings. The conservationists' argument that we must save species because we need their ecosystem services is feeble. The contention seems to suggest that the role of other species is to assure our well-being. Uh, at some point, we might so simplify ecosystems that we could no longer extract resources, but socioeconomic rationales for conservation, including yet to be discovered cures for our illnesses, all seem a bit disingenuous. These arguments are similar to speculations about all the financial rewards and social recognitions that could accrue from returning a lost wallet. The ultimate and perhaps only compelling reason to return a wallet is that it's the right thing to do. Perhaps this also holds for why we ought to look after our fellow inhabitants of the earth. My applied entomology textbook suggests that insect outbreaks are evidence of a disturbed or out of balance ecosystem. As with a well-behaved child, species should refrain from outbursts. This Victoria, Victorian era interpretation of the ideal emotional state may well be a social legacy of Darwin's uniformitarianism, an idea that emerged as a reaction to the church's reliance on catastrophes to explain the history of the earth. But whatever its origin, the, the notion, perhaps it traces all the way back to the Greek ideal of the golden mean. The virtue of consistency lives on in our perception that an outbreak or crash of a population is an unnatural aberration, an indication of a troubled species. But, but the light motif of the Rocky Mountain locust was its phenomenal flights of reproductive fancy with manic swarms sweeping over the plains only to subsequently collapse into pockets of exhausted survivors. Evidence of this pattern was embedded in the annual layers of Knife Point Glacier, which revealed a pattern of locust outbreaks extending centuries prior to European alterations of the North American landscape. Erratic, even explosive population dynamics do not require anthropogenic disturbance, nor do they necessarily reflect dysfunctionality. It is true that people, species, and ecosystems can manif manifest extreme dynamics during times of trouble. But all too often, we are alarmed by nonconformity, not because of a concern for other beings, but because of our self-interest in having a predictable world, our socio-political intolerance of radicalism, and our economic objective of slow but steady growth. Sometimes, the outburst of joy from a child, the cry of anguish from a neighbor, or the outpouring of life by a species does not need to be fixed, controlled, or managed, but understood, accepted, and honored. Upon returning from our first expedition to the glaciers of the Rocky Mountains, my colleagues and I submitted a paper portraying what we had found at Grasshopper Glacier in southern Montana. We described the location of deposits, the types of insect parts we had extracted, the radiocarbon dating, and the analysis that led us to believe that we had recovered remains of the Rocky Mountain locust. As the first report of this site in nearly 50 years, we hoped the manuscript would be well received. It was rejected. The editor of Environmental Entomology explained that the study did not constitute a controlled experiment. Where, where were we supposed to find a control glacier? And what experiment could we have done if we had located such a resource? My appeal to the editorial board was denied with the incisive summary, and I quote, you have mistaken natural history for science. Oh, it seems that statistical design and controlled experimentation defined science for the research community. 
This suggested that initiatives such as Darwin's voyage decidedly lacking a clear hypothesis, and NASA's deep space probes, utterly devoid of replication, are not science. It was as if nothing of value was left to describe in the natural world, a rather remarkable position for entomology, a field in which 90% of its fundamental units of study, that is insect species, are unknown. Even more disturbing was the notion that science required manipulation of the natural world rather than patient observation or thoughtful description. The Rocky Mountain locust is gone, and no experiment can retrace the events that led to its demise, explain the role it played in Western ecosystems, or re reveal what other species may have perished along with it. Its tale will be told, if at all, to those willing to listen rather than those demanding answers. Although it required nearly 100 years, we finally resolved that the Rocky Mountain locust was a true species. But a greater question remains. The debate itself raises the issue of what constitutes a species and reveals our philosophical biases. We usually conceive of the world in terms of material things. For example, a species is the sum total of its members. But this presumes the metaphysical truth of materialism, that to be real is to be made of matter. Ecology, however, is beginning to shift its focus with tentative explorations of what the world would look like if process rather than matter was the basis for reality. For the Rocky Mountain locust, it was the swarms or more precisely the process of swarming that constituted this remarkable species. This perception of the locust essence is counter to the material terms in which we usually conceive the world. We normally define a species as a set of individuals with the capacity to successfully interbreed. This orthodox definition equates being real with being made of matter. In this light, a species is the sum total of its members, the Rocky Mountain locust being comprised of trillions of bodies that washed over the continent, washed over the continent like a living tsunami. Tsunami. A wave is not water. Our sense that a wave is a mound of moving water is an illusion. The wave is the energy coursing through the fluid, while the fluid is merely the observable evidence of that which surges within. A wave is no more the water than wind is trembling aspen leaves. In this light, we might seriously doubt whether the monarch butterfly, for example, can be conserved within a refuge, a zoological garden, a vial of DNA, or a genetic sequence. If this species could not cluster against the chill rains of winter and sprawl into the milkweed patches of summer, what would we have conserved? What if a thing is what it does? What if we defined a species in terms of its life processes? On this light, the Rocky Mountain locust was an immense aperiodic energy flow that linked living systems across a continent. It died well before the last corporeal manifestation disappeared. Now, perhaps somewhere in the vastness of the Rocky Mountains, a remnant population of the locust clings to life within a fragment habitat. Oh, but they would be no more their original species than a colony of monarch butterflies flitting within a glass house. Unless the locust could once again blacken the skies, it would, in fact, be something else. Perhaps a Rocky Mountain grasshopper, but not the Rocky Mountain locust. As you might know, 2002 passed without any recognition of its being the centennial of the material demise of the Rocky Mountain locust. There was neither mourning nor celebration of this biologically momentous event. Perhaps our willingness to overlook the passing of this species was a matter of blissful ignorance, for if we understood the story of its extinction, the implications for our environmental complacency would be most disturbing. The simplest lesson that we can learn from the Rocky Mountain locust is that numerical abundance does not assure future survival. Having exceeded seven billion people, we need only look back at the voracious swarms of the Rocky Mountain locusts that blackened the skies of North America to realize that our future as a species is no brighter for our quantity. Being abundant, polyphagous, and highly mobile is no guarantee against extinction. There does, however, seem to be a major difference between our condition and that of the Rocky Mountain locust. This species has become wholly reliant on a place, requiring it to sacrifice other options, 
and accept the risks of being profoundly and deeply linked to a landscape. For the locust, the fertile river valleys of the west were its sanctuary, a habitat where it could always find what it needed and persist in the face of adversity. The complex and intimate connections between the land and native species are difficult and perhaps impossible to express in objective scientific terms. But sacred places are central to the well being of many creatures. Even with all the right conditions of temperature, light, humidity, and diet, well, animals often languish in zoos. They are unable to express what is missing, and perhaps we would be unable to understand unless unless we too had experienced the soul-wrenching loss of being forced from a farm or ranch that had been in the family for generations, or being driven from a homeland that defined our traditions, stories, and hopes. Despite my deep understanding that the Rocky Mountain locust is gone as a species, I've searched for remnant populations in the irrational hope of meeting a few survivors. They may no longer be able to transform into the migratory phase, but I imagine that being in the midst of this noble creature might well transform me, much like being in the presence of a wise teacher. My surveys of grasshoppers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem have yet to yield a specimen of this long lost creature. But even if I found a pocket of habitat still harboring the locust, well, regulatory officials might well advocate their destruction as the potential for a return to the swarms of the 1800s would be plausible. Even the vaunted Endangered Species Act exempts pests from protection. So perhaps this remnant population would be accorded the same status as the last vial of smallpox. I like to imagine that in an ironic peak, economic entomologists would point out that a remnant population of the Rocky Mountain locust that had not bothered us for a century could hardly be termed a pest. And from the environmental camp, a few voices might call for protecting these insects as important components of a native ecosystem struggling to sustain its biological integrity. There might be some appeals to the Rocky Mountain locust capacity to serve as a reminder that we must share this world with other species, even those that we have not tamed or controlled. And a few advocates would probably invoke the powerful place of this species in the story of the West and the folklore of America. But in the end, oh, in the end, would our decision really be different from that made by the people of Amazonia today or that, or, or that which would have been made had the early pioneers realized that they had reduced their nemesis to a single locale? You know, if we struggle so mightily with whether we should save the last bits of old growth forest and the few untrammeled tracks of the Arctic, what hope would a locust have? What have we really learned about ourselves and our place in the natural world? And so in this final 17 minute scene of the opera, the scientist reflects on the meaning of the species existence and the extinction with the rancher and the locust as the insect's ghost challenges him to discover more than the facts, more than the facts. She wants him to understand the values that lurk behind the story of her destruction. So enjoy, and when we return, I'll offer some final thoughts on, making, on the making of the opera from the perspective of the librettist. Okay, so I think we can go, whoops, hang on. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
von uns in Tumont in Toxic Winter. Yes, 
So let me now go to, oops, back to my PowerPoint. Well, well, that's quite a story. And opera is an ideal genre for epic narratives. So the tale of the Rocky Mountain Locust would seem to beg for an operatic treatment. However, as a writer, I've learned that it's quite a long way from having a great idea to producing a good piece of work. My role in Locust the Opera was that of the, the librettist, since the words of an opera are technically a libretto, although most folks would reasonably call them lyrics, making me a lyricist. But it's fun to be involved in a 400-year-old art form with its own terminology and traditions. In conceiving of the libretto, I had three major concerns. First, I wanted to capture the ecological richness of the story. The creatures deserve to be treated with scientific accuracy. Next, I sought to explore the moral complexity of the events. On the one hand, the devastation by the locusts caused terrible suffering, so the loss of these creatures was a good thing. On the other hand, wasn't something of value lost with the extinction of this remarkable species? And finally, I wanted to tell a story. A great deal of research supports the value of embedding information and questions in a narrative structure as people are far more likely to access, understand, and remember what they see or hear in a storied context. With those objectives in mind, I next faced three major challenges. First was the matter of distillation. I needed to, I needed to condense my book of 100,000 words into a lib libretto of about 1,350 words, a reduction of more than 98%. Next, it was necessary to take a story that involved dozens of personalities from famous scientists to obscure settlers and create just a few individuals to carry the richness of the narrative. And finally, I sought to foster a compelling aesthetic, a beauty of language that would unfold in the space between prose and poetry, between nonfiction and fiction. My strategy to address the concerns and challenges was to write through the perspective of three characters manifesting the blended archetypes of the magician sage, the hero explorer, and the innocent orphan. These included the ghost of the Rocky Mountain locust released from the rapidly melting glaciers in an entomological homage to Hamlet, which Franco Faccio transformed into an opera in 1865. The second character was the hard-driving scientist who was haunted by the ghost, locust's ghost until he can discover who or what caused the death of her kind. And the third character is the rancher, a man whose grandfather was driven from his farm by locusts and who tells the scientist a story, a story that provides the qualitative insights necessary for him to solve the ecological murder mystery. At the end of my story about the Rocky Mountain locusts, I asked, what have we really learned about ourselves and our place in the natural world? This is the question sung by the locust of the Rocky Mountain, the ghost of the Rocky Mountain locust in the final line of the opera. The story of the collision between this species and our own is a timeless tale of arrogance and humility. And perhaps never before in human history has it been more vital for us to come to terms with our power and our responsibility regarding the natural world. And so with that, I will turn this back over to our program hosts. I think I've done that. Let's see. Yes. All right. Thank you, Jeff. You bet. Um, well, wow, um, this is Butch <laughs> Butler, and I'm the remaining board founder of the forum, which started in 2003. And I have to say, this is the most unique 
creative, engaging, and thought-provoking presentation we've ever had. Um, that said, I'm going to share screen. Oh boy. Let's see, I guess I want to do that now. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this um, award that we're going to present to Jeff. Um, Jeff, we're pleased to present this to you. This is a beautiful Amazonite mineral specimen on top of the award. Um, these Amazonite crystals are found in the Pikes Peak, Batholith, um, west of Colorado Springs. And this award will be shipped to you soon. Um, so on behalf of the Collegiate Peaks Forum Series, thank you for speaking this evening, evening and becoming a part of our legacy. And um, Christine, are there questions? Did you see any questions in the chat? Only, only one from me, Anne. <laughs> Oh, okay. no, there, no. oh, there are actually two. There are two questions. One was from, um, well, one wasn't really a question, but it was from Stephen Whittington, who I know and love, uh, who said, I like the guy with the net from the opera. And I think that the question that comes out of that is the, um, the, the, the actors in the opera, I'm not, as familiar with the opera as I should with opera as I should be, but tell us a little bit about the people who were the characters in the opera. The the um, ghost of the locust was so much like a locust; it was just amazing. So, can you tell us a little bit about where the actors came from? Oh, I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> um, so, let's begin with the soprano, Kristen Colvin. Kristen Colvin is from Denver. So she's one of your neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen um, sings in a whole wide range of contexts, from jazz to gothic, gothic opera to classical opera. Um, she's got a tremendous range. Um, her her money making, well, I guess you know how how it is with musicians these days. Her uh, her day job is uh, in information technology, um, and so. Uh, she also did a great deal of work in terms of um, uh, basically the, the movement of the performers. Um, and so, you know, while I, I do the words and, and, and Dr. Guzzo does the music, um, they do the singing. It turns out opera involves bodies moving around a stage, um, and it's best if they don't run into each other. Um, and so she basically choreographed the movement of of the um, of the performers as well. So that's uh, Kristen, and she was locust-like. I want to remind you, her mm -hmm. her costume and her makeup and her hair were all done by um, Ashley Carlisle, of the uh, an artist at University of Wyoming. So that's that's Kristen. Um, the scientist is um, Todd Teske. Todd Teske is from uh, Colorado Springs. Um, the bizarre story there is that we didn't know this. All, well, basically, um, all three of the singers we acquired um, through Thomas Blomster, who was the conductor of the Colorado Chamber Orchestra. So the conductor is also from, he's actually from Pueblo. Um, and so that's the Colorado Chamber Orchestra. And he had worked with these three singers before. Well, it turns out that Todd Teske's uh, wife is the choral director for my wife's Aunt's Corral in Colorado Springs. And so there's a weird circular connection there. Todd Teske um, is a tenor. Um, he sings, uh, for the most part, from, from what I know of Todd, he sings uh, various uh, classical pieces. He's sung around the world. His day job, as it were, is uh, he's a concert pianist tuner. And he is tuned for some extraordinarily high profile pianists. Um, and he, uh, he actually began his musical career with trumpet um, and then acquired one of these repetitive strain sorts of things where he, he could no longer make an embouche or whatever that, that word is that trumpeters do. Um, and so he moved from trumpet to voice um, and he's, he's done extremely well as a tenor. Uh, the, third, the third singer, our rancher, um, is Eric Angerhofer. 
Um, Eric is, uh, was, when, when you, the performance you saw, he was a doctoral student at University of Colorado in, in voice. Uh, he earned his doctorate. He's now has a faculty position at Xavier, I'm pretty sure. Um, so he's moved out of state, but he was, he was one of, he was one of yours as well. The interesting thing about him is his avocation is mixed martial arts. Um, and so uh, it's interesting in, in talking to him after many beers, the ways in which he draws parallels between the discipline of the body in mixed martial arts and the discipline of the voice in opera singing. So he actually sees them as sort of mirror images uh, of one another. So uh, we have a piano tuner and info tech specialist and a martial artist on stage. So that's the three singers. And again, Thomas Blomster was the conductor of the Colorado Chamber Orchestra. We have, thank you. <laughs> Mixed martial arts and opera. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we have another question. What happened to all the biomass of all those trillions of bodies? A lot, a lot of that biomass um, basically was was locked up in their bodies, they die, and they turn out to be a gigantic supply of fertilizer. As a matter of fact, um, one of the interesting things in reading the old histories is if, if a farmer who had, had a uh, locust invade, if, if that farmer could, could survive to the next year, um, he almost always had a, 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 a bountiful crop. And it was because of all the locust feces and bodies left behind. It was like having a gigantic input of nitrogen to the soil. Um, and so what the locusts were doing was leaving behind or moving nitrogen as well as phosphorus, potassium, and some other uh, minerals from place to place. And while in the year in which they invaded, it was a disaster because you were eaten down to the soil, what they left behind um, provided you with a bountiful crop in the next year, if you could make it to the next year. So that's a lot of bodies. The ones in the glacier are now melting out. Um, mm -hmm. The glaciers, the Rocky Mountain glaciers are receding at a jaw dropping uh, rate. Uh, it was kind of funny, I, w I was up there on Knife Point Glacier. Uh, I guess it's been now uh, almost uh, probably seven years since I was there last. Uh, and I went up with a National Geographic film crew and uh, I was taking them up and it had been almost a decade at that point since I'd been up there to recover the bodies of the locusts. When I went up there, we went up this, this narrow place called Indian Pass and over the top. And I had this sort of panic moment where I thought I've brought them to the wrong place because I couldn't recognize the glacier which was supposed to be on the mountainside at my feet. And I thought, holy crap, what's going on? Totally disoriented. And I was finally able to figure out that this hump of rock, which we had very cleverly named Lunch Rock, because that's where we had lunch, um, which was just this kind of heap of, uh, heap of solid rock, um, maybe 15 feet poking out of the ice, was now an 85 foot column of rock. So the ice had dropped 80 feet, um, probably 75, 80 feet, in the decades since I had been there last. The ice was disappearing that fast. An enormous, staggering numbers of locust bodies have washed out of the glacier and are piling up in these great heaps along the sides of the glacier. From a distance, it looks like a like dump truck had, had dumped piles of peat moss. Um, but then as you get closer, it's all decomposing locust bodies, legs, um, mandibles, wings. It's uh, um, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, we recovered some material, but the glacier is simply melting faster than scientists could recover the valuable material that was, was stored in the ice. That's a lot of locust ghosts. Uh, another, <laughs> another question, and this was actually for me also, is I wonder if the settlers of the 1870s, 80s perceived locust swarms as a biblical event, a sign of the end times. They, they absolutely did. Um, so in my book, Locust, um, I, I've got a, a fairly decent section, fairly large section on religious responses to the locusts. Um, and it's fascinating because um, at that time, uh, the locusts were perceived in sort of Old Testament terms. And of course, what do we know about the locust arrival um, to the Pharaoh? It's because he was a sinner, right? He was a bad guy. 
right? And they and the locusts arrived because they were um, sent by God as a punishment. Um, and so when the locusts were invading the West, um, there were kind of there there was this this sense among some religious leaders that the pioneers um, had it coming, that they must have been living depraved lives. They must have done something wrong, that this was punishment for sin. Um, and actually the country at that time had never really dealt with a natural disaster of this scale, something that was way beyond local or state governments to deal with. Um, and it was sort of one of the first times in our history where we had this notion, right, that if you just worked really hard, really, really hard, if you if you live the Protestant work ethic, especially on the land, right, you would succeed. And here you had this, all of these people who were not only failing, but potentially starving. And were they all lazy? Have they all lacked character? Well, clearly not. And so coming to terms with how poverty can happen to those who work really, really hard um, was something that we had to deal with in, in the 1880s, 1870s, in the 1970s, 80s, and then <laughs> and today, right? So this question of whether the poor deserve their poverty is a question that this country has wrestled with you know, for, for 150, 200 years. This notion that, that um, poverty is a sign of poor character was, was just so overturned and challenged by the arrival of these locusts. Um, so, um, you know, the locusts, it was, it's kind of, if you read back in history, whether locusts are sent by an angry God or not turns out to have been a, a, a fairly, a little digression here, but it's a fascinating story, I think. Um, yeah. There's a, a wonderful book written, I think, in the 1940s called The Capital Punishment of Animals. Um, and it's a series of stories, a tale, it's, it's all nonfiction, of the ways in which humans have punished animals by killing them, right? So the capital, and so, the more prosaic things are uh, the village dog bites somebody and they actually put the village dog on trial and they kill it, right? Um, sometimes they hung, they actually hung uh, a, a bull that had gored somebody. So it's kind of a weird notion. Um, but um, back in, I think it was the ooh, 13, 1400s, locust swarms moved out of Africa up into Europe. And uh, the people appealed to the church and said, the locusts have arrived. Would you you know, let's get the local the local priest to appeal to the bishop and we'll let the bishop cast um, a curse on them, an anathema, right? An official curse of the church. And so, but before you can pronounce an anathema or before the Catholic church could curse um, these, these uh, anything, um, there had to be what was called an ecclesiastical trial. So it's, I've actually seen the transcript. They put the locusts on trial. They were put on trial by the church. Now they were given a, um, a representative um, and it's very, very clever lawyer for the lo lawyer for the locusts. Um, his his view was, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we curse these these insects, we you're assuming that they're the work of the devil. But what if the villagers were leading depraved lives? What if they were all sinning? Maybe these locusts are sent by an angry god to punish these sinful farmers. If that's the case, then do you want to be you know, the bishop who casts a curse on God's messengers, that could have real repercussions. Um, and so from Old Testament through medieval times, through the 1800s, this question of what locusts mean, right, um, in a religious sense. But interestingly, I think that continues today. I mean, think about um, Hurricane Katrina and the discussions um, from religious leaders about whether New Orleans was being punished, right? New Orleans, the, you know, sin city. And so this notion that natural disasters strike sinful people and that you know, poverty is a function of a lack of character, we can kind of chuckle, you know, at the, the naivete in the 1800s or in the 1400s, but I think it's still with us. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more question from from Rebecca. Did the settlers see this as an apocalyptic event and an end times happening that kind of merges with the last question, but were they that this was a millennial issue? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't I don't think they they did. They, they saw it as their own disaster, their own crisis, their own uh, horror um, as we 
as we heard from Laura Ingalls Wilder. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think they saw it as sort of a cosmic or planetary, um, you know, end times or, or apocalypse. Um, I don't think they sort of scaled up their anxiety to that level. Um, they, I mean, they, they, they certainly were in some ways apocalyptic in terms of their impact, um, but I don't think they had that sort of global sense that this was portending the end times, um, unless the end times meant the end of your farm, in which case <laughs> they were definitely the end times. That, that's for sure. Well, well Jeff, uh, I believe that you have covered all of the <laughs> Uh, topics in the mission of the Collegiate Peaks Forum series, which is spirituality, philosophy, and science <laughs> in one lecture. We are, in there. we are so pleased that you, that you came to speak to us tonight. Well, thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate it. It would have been even better to be able to meet everybody and chat in person, um, but uh, I guess this is the next best thing these days. Yes, yes, and uh, I'm hoping that we do all get to do that at some point. But thank you so much. And you thank bet. you for everybody who attended. It's been a wonderful presentation. Uh, and a lot to think about tonight, and I hope that everybody has really interesting dreams. <laughs>